Hi there, and uh, welcome to the second workshop, workshop two, um, on uh, systematic review coordinating bodies and how they can help you. Um, we have a panel discussion um, in this session, um, along uh, with or starting with three presentations about the three major uh, review coordinating bodies um, that we've invited along today. Uh, the Campbell Collaboration, Cochrane, and the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence. So we'll start off, um, I'm really excited to introduce uh, one of the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon family, uh, again, Vivian Welch, um, who gave our keynote presentation. She's going to um, briefly tell you about the Campbell Collaboration. So over to you, Vivian. Uh, great, okay. Thanks, Neil, for the introduction. Um, well, I'm excited to be here, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I did actually prepare slides because I was hoping we would have uh, questions, um, but I will um, maybe give a brief update um, about Campbell and I'll just um, share my screen. Okay, I think that worked. Um, um, so Campbell Collaboration, because I don't know how much you know about us, uh, I'm the Editor-in-Chief and um, we are a global organization. I'm based in Canada. Uh, our CEO is based in Germany and we have offices in uh, Delhi and in Oslo. And um, we celebrated our 20th year last year. Uh, we published the SMAC reviews in the social sectors, so we cover um, topics uh, like education, social welfare, crime and justice, international development, and um, we're growing uh, uh, new groups in the areas of nutrition, um, uh, disability, uh, aging, and hope to grow more. Um, so I actually did this slide three years ago when I started as editor-in-chief. Uh, these were the, uh, the main people involved in editorial teams. Um, and we expanded and brought on all these new people, including a group on climate solutions, uh, which Neil Hathaway um, is a, a co-chair and editor uh, in. Um, and we're still a growing organization. So um, we've been publishing, this is our, our key performance dashboard. We've been publishing about 15 to 20 systematic reviews per year, uh, the last three years. Um, and we've almost at, or might have reached 200 publications in our library. And I think that's um, one of the roles of, our, um, of evidence synthesis coordinating bodies uh, like Campbell is, is having a library that makes these systematic reviews accessible, discoverable um, to those who wanna use them to make decisions. Um, and um, this is one indicator of uh, the, the authors of our uh, reviews. Our um, biggest growth is in uh, India in the last year. Um, and the other thing about, I think another role of evidence synthesis co uh, coordinating bodies like ourselves is that um, we have a role of uh, advocating for evidence synthesis within our sectors. So uh, within the social sectors, um, uh, Campbell is involved in promoting evidence synthesis and rigorous evidence synthesis uh, with uh, potential users like the Education Endowment Foundation, uh, the What Works Centers in the UK, um, and decision makers. Uh, and one of the indicators, I think, of our uh, you know advocacy role is is the impact of our reviews. So this is an ex um, just an example of some of our top cited reviews. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention again with the impact is altmetrics is an indication of where, um, how much our reviews are being picked up in the news, uh, in Twitter and Facebook and policy, et cetera. But what we've done with these altmetric scores that we get now, um, because we're publishing with Wiley and um, uh, this is one of the features on that platform is that um, uh, when we pick up uh, news stories through the altmetrics, um, we uh, subsequently write up those stories as uh, cases of policy influence. So I think that's another role of evidence synthesis coordinating bodies is, is promoting um, and uh, um, 
extending the reach of reviews within the sectors uh, where we're involved. Um, and I guess uh, I really hope that you'll join the Campbell family. Um, there's lots to do. I think um, uh, I'm probably going to stop there with the role focusing on advocacy. I think another role um, with, uh, with um, uh, evidence coordinating bodies is um, it's, it's making our reviews accessible and interpretable. Um, so some of you may have heard the What Works Global Summit plenary by Larry Hedges uh, that was last October. Um, it's online, so you can find it if you're interested. Um, but he gave a, a wonderful history of uh, the Campbell collaboration in the social sectors that um, in the social sectors, there is a history of evidence synthesis um, using uh, statistical approaches to do required moderator analyses, but then publishing in um, statistical journals, which are not accessible to decision makers and policymakers. And one thing which distinguishes reviews in the, the Campbell remit is that they are aimed at the, the users of the evidence. Um, and so they should be interpretable. And that is one of our roles is to improve that uh, interpretability. And um, that's it. I think I'll pass on to the next speaker. Uh, let me just stop sharing. And I hope there'll be lots of questions. Thanks so much, Vivian. That's great. Um, so next we're going to move over to Jordi, um, who's going to introduce us, Jordi Padipado, so who's going to introduce us to Cochrane. Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, okay, I was a bit jealous of Vivian, so I decided to have uh, some uh, slides just briefly to explain about uh, Cochrane. So Cochrane is an organization that was built on a dream of this man that was to throw the challenge uh, to the medical profession of saying why we don't have a place where we can have all the research uh, uh, organized periodically set up so that we can know what we know about all the uh, relevant randomized control trials. So, and after that is how uh, Cochrane was created with the mission of improving, uh, or the vision of improving health by providing uh, high quality, relevant, accessible, systematic reviews that could inform health decisions. So at the end, uh, on, on, on the line of interpretability that Vivian was talking about, the idea here is that we can produce evidence synthesis that could help to make better decisions uh, uh, at the end. So uh, Cochrane is a huge organization. So we just uh, recently passed the 100,000 uh, number of uh, members. And as you can see in the map, we have uh, plenty of people in all the continents. However, the contribution and uh, is not always the best. You can have here some of the links of how you can get. And here's a map that I really love that kind of shows what is the systematic review uh, activity depending on the citation rates or depending on the country specific age indices that uh, is kind of a fancy and it kind of shows the idea of what I think is the role of these big organizations. So building uh, beyond not trying to get uh, reviews that could be easy to interpret and actually uh, help on the decision making I think one of the roles that coordinating uh, groups can play is on setting up standards that uh, about how the data is going to be presented and how the data is going to be used. So that could really fit into an evidence ecosystem and therefore we can uh, both get data easily and update our systematic reviews in a more, much more efficient way. And on the other side that this data can be used and reused either for replication projects, either for modifying slightly what is your question or just for doing meta research about what is the best way uh, of doing things. And I hope that there are a bit more questions about what else we could be doing. Brilliant, thanks so much, Jordi. And then finally, over to Jackie, who's going to introduce the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence. Hello there, everyone. Thanks, Neil. So I uh, am very honoured to be presenting a short introduction on the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence, or commonly known as CEE. And the CEE is probably a bit more of what I would describe as a, a baby when it's compared to the uh, Cochrane Collaboration and also Campbell, in that it's been going for about, um, about 10 years or so. So the overarching aim of the CEE if I can get my slides to click forwards, 
is to promote and support rigorous evidence synthesis on issues of greatest concern to environmental policy and management. Um, and it does this in a number of key ways. So by providing a platform um, for registering, for peer reviewing and publishing evidence synthesis, much like Cochrane and Campbell, uh, the CEE has a journal, which I'll describe in a couple of slides forward. It also provides guidelines and standards for planning and conducting evidence synthesis to the CEE standards. We provide training and workshops and develop new methodology, and we are providing an evidence service for decision makers as well, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides forward. And amongst all of this, one really important and key thing we do is to maintain a network of collaborations across the sort of global evidence synthesis community, but also with people who are upcoming and new evidence synthesis um, participants to really build capacity and to advance the subject for evidence synthesis, particularly in this environmental um, field. So where are we based? Uh, we're based across the globe, so um, in fewer centres than um, some of our other collaborations. Uh, that you've just heard about, um, but we have eight key centres globally, um, and one of those is where I'm based. I'm in the UK centre at the University of Exeter, which is um, a joint, one of the three hubs that make up the CEE UK centre. In terms of the areas which we cover, so the name's a bit of a giveaway really, it's all about environmental management, and hum the impact of human activities on the natural environment. And those many of our uh, first systematic reviews and maps were about this topic area. So effectiveness of interventions in the environmental field. More recently though, we've been lo looking to link more between how health and the environment um, link together, the health environment and access, and also um, social welfare through um, collaborations with others in the networks. So Evidence Synthesis International and GESI, you may have heard of, uh, Global Evidence Synthesis Initiative. So the CEE has a number of online and freely available resources. These include the, the guidelines I've just mentioned. So on the CEE website, you can access those freely. They are updated regularly. The last update was in 2018, and it's a great resource for people who um, are new to systematic reviews and maps and can really give you some guidance as to what the gold standards are for conducting evidence synthesis in this topic area. Uh, we also have an online and open access database of evidence syntheses. Now this actually includes not only um, systematic reviews in the environmental fields, but also um, reviews which might not have been conducted to um, uh, systematic standards. And we have a team of reviewers who've, um, who've assessed those syntheses um, against a set criteria. And it's a useful database for people who want to know more about a topic and want to know what reviews have been done in a topic, um, whilst having some kind of um, indication of how those reviews were carried out in terms of relations to other standards of reviewing. We also have a number of open software and reporting forms. You may have heard of the ROSES reporting form, which is similar to the PRISMA, which you may have heard about as well. And these support reviews teams to conduct their reviews according to the CEE guidelines and uh, support um, teams to produce reviews, which will be um, hopefully accepted into the online journal, which is called Environmental Evidence. Uh, that's published by BMJ, British Medical Journal um, Group of Publishing. Um, and it's where the CEE um, suggests that you uh, uh, publish your systematic reviews and protocols and maps. And finally, I just want to move on to the CEE training team, because this is a really core part of um, what CEE does. Um, and I'm proud to say I was there at the very beginning, um, setting up the CEE training team back in the very, very early 2000s. We were um, we now endorse trainers and training courses as CE certified. We have, um, as individuals, provided a, a whole range of CE endorsed training in evidence synthesis across the world. Um, and we're very proud of the network which we've created and the people that we've supported to develop their own systematic reviews through this training. 
Uh, we provide a network of support and guidance for um, CE endorsed trainers, and we continually monitor, monitor and develop our training activities to make sure that they are in line with the guidelines of the CE, and also they reflect any new kind of state of the art methodology updates which um, have been coming about in recent years. So I think that's all I wanted to say about that. And we're really looking forward to both myself and um, Andrew Pullen, who's also on the line, um, to answering your questions. So thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Jackie. That's great. So we are already getting quite a few questions coming in. We've got um, around 22, 23 people joining live on YouTube um, and uh, about 35 um, people uh, 39 people um, joining um, via YouTube at some stage. Um, so some of the questions that we have so far um, are from Luke McGuinness, who asks um, quite a specific question about tools from the perspective of the audience at this conference. Um, would organizing bodies be open to better integration between their systems? Uh, for example, RevMan for Cochrane, an existing R package functionality like Metaphor Reporter, um, which is the reporting function from uh, Wolfgang Wichtbauer's um, package Metaphor for meta-analysis, um, or RobVis for paired forest or risk of bias um, plots, rather than having teams develop two different implementations of the same functionality. So, um, I guess it's the systems that you're already using in your organizations. Um, would you be open to them sort of communicating more with the R community um, to see how they could better integrate instead of um, copying and pasting information across or having to format it through a text file or some other data format? Yeah, I can start with this one if you want. So uh, th this is, uh, th thank you for the question because I think it's also a good example of highlighting of the possibilities that standardizing could uh, provide. And one of them is that it will make this kind of integration of different tools a lot easier. Uh, this is certainly the direction that uh, with Cochrane are, uh, are we going. Uh, the, the idea of moving Redman from a, a, a software that is on the desktop to a web-based software, uh, one of the main drivers of this decision uh, is the fact that it will allow these integrations to be done much easily. One of the barriers we had in order to uh, add improvements into the uh, into Redman is that um, it it was really time consuming and, and a whole endeavor to get the software updated into all the devices so they are compatible with him, with them. Now we can, we can release a Redman Web update every day, and and actually they are they are doing that. Redman Web is is being improved. Week by week, there is a the Redman Web Development team. They are having weekly meetings, showing how things are improving, and this is what is actually already happening. On having settled that, that, that this is the direction of travel. Uh, I I don't think in the specific question you're asking of how these tools are going to be integrated, this is not going to be easy. It's not going to be fast. So we are now uh, highlighting some of the tools that are using. We are integrating with uh, Great Pro in order to produce the summary fi findings. We are working on the implementation of integration with the Magic App. And even with these things that are already uh, somehow integrated into the, let's call Cochrane workflow, still to get it to work seemingly in, into the seamless, into the, sim, uh, into the same system, is it still showing to be a, a much harder task that we uh, uh, we're anticipating? So from one side of saying the direction of travel, yes, is to be able to work with one tool and that you can choose which tools are you going to be using inside this one. That's the the, the dream on the pipeline for uh, for the future. Uh, I, I think we still have a lot of technical and and logistical issues to solve before this could be. Um, meaningless operation for everybody involved, from the programmers to the user. Thanks so much, Julie. I might pass this over to Vivian quickly, um, if that's okay, because I know we've had discussions very recently about um, different formats for publishing um, that might use different tools, like we were talking about the markdown, and um, I'm not sure if you saw Matteo Mancini's presentation uh, using the um, eLife format for a sort of replicable um, meta-analysis instead of PDFs. 
I wondered what Cochrane, uh, what Campbell rather feels about this or your experiences. Yeah, so um, thanks, Neil, and thanks, uh, Luke, for the question also. Um, so as Neil knows, uh, Campbell has uh, made the jump to um, using ResMan as our publishing platform uh, in 2018, uh, but we don't, um, Campbell is not involved in the programming of Review Manager. Um, but the reason we decided to continue with RevMan Web as our, our platform for publishing is that it does um, <clears throat> have a structure um, for all of the components of the review so that um, the, it could enable sharing the, the components of the review in a way that would be more usable. But I, I think it's like uh, Jordi is saying, a future step that we're not there yet. Um, I think incorporating other tools, um, because um, uh, as Jordi says, I think incorporating them into Review Manager is a future step that may take time. Um, Campbell welcomes uh, people uh, doing their analyses in other software, but as you say, it needs to be brought into Review Manager for the publication. Um, what we're exploring with the publisher is how to make uh, additional files available um, so that um, we can make the data available um, and start to promote open synthesis. But I think that the, the talking of the tools across each other is, uh, is where we wanna go in the future. We're not there yet. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. But we'd love to work with you to find out how to do it better. So maybe we could take this offline and, uh, and see what could be done. I think Cochrane would probably like that too. I can't speak for them, but. That's great, thank you so much. That answers it really well, I think. Um, I wonder if I could hand over to Andrew um, now, uh, who is um, representing the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence. He's um, editor in chief of the Environmental Evidence Journal. Um, and um, I wondered what your perspectives are around uh, open synthesis and open data and open methods. And as a secondary question, um, whether you think there's a slight difference because there's a difference in size of these organizations, if some of them are a little bit more agile, or some of them, you know, if that's a trade-off with the experience and the capacity of volunteers versus the agility. Um, well, I think, um, in principle, I mean, everything is a little bit in principle as far as CE is concerned at the moment. It, uh, um, and there are real practical challenges to, to overcome. I mean, with Luke's question, I think, uh, you know, I, I certainly was going to answer it by saying the simple answer is yes, that we, we do want to um, uh, work with the other collaborations to, um, to use as far as possible the same, the same tools. Uh, I say as far as possible because, of course, we deal with very different sorts of data um, and we're trying to synthesize different sorts of data in, in general. So, for example, um, I, I know you mentioned, um, I think risk of bias was mentioned. So we're, we're developing um, and I've got on the website at the moment um, a, a trial uh, risk of bias tool. Um, but it is based on, um, you know, the, the Cochrane risk of bias uh, tool and it's, it's an adaptation. So a lot of the things we do are adaptations of, of what's previously been done. Um, and we think that's obviously a sensible way forward. Uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we're, we're a, as you said, a, an organization that has relatively limited resources, but we haven't, otherwise we, we haven't integrated in terms of tools. We don't, we don't use Revman um, uh, at the moment. And um, I would, but I would welcome, you know, any any um, uh, suggestions for for us to do that. Uh, but uh, and I think that sort of integration needs to be discussed. And it's one reason why uh, Evidence Synthesis International um, has uh, has come about, which is uh, you know has all three collaborations in it plus some some other organisations. Uh, and we we have recently been talking about the, just this very subject about uh, you know when, when we're working together to to work you know to develop you know, co-develop uh, various uh, various aspects of what we do. So so that I mean I think I can only answer these things in in a very general sense. 
um, that yes, we are we are um, very much looking to the future in terms of integration of our of our systems and op open open uh, science, open you know open synthesis is is part of that. It's all it's all part of that. So uh, I don't think we're different in our outlook at all from Cochrane or or Campbell. We're just a uh, a little bit more challenged to some extent, I think, with uh, what we need to do. Thanks so much, Andrew. That's a really great perspective. You've really nicely segued into uh, another question that was asking about um, in what ways the three organisations are working together. Um, obviously, you're all here as part of the Evidence Synthesis Hackathons event, ESMACONF, um, and um, I have already introduced in the starting uh, the welcoming session yesterday that there's a, a joint series of papers on evidence synthesis technology between uh, Campbell Systematic Reviews and Environmental Evidence, the CE journal. But I wondered, um, our, our uh, people on Slack were wondering if there are other ways that the organizations are working together. Um, and just sort of in the back of my head, I have that we have another workshop on collaboration to reduce research waste in a different workshop. So it's a shame that they're separate workshops, but I think there's overlapping points. Um, so Andrew, maybe if you want to speak on that quickly, and then we'll hand over to Geordie and Vivian. If that's well, right. and well, Vivian and I were having a chat just on on Monday um, about um, rapid reviews and um, and where we're going with rapid reviews. And um, this has partly been. Um, you know, put on the agenda, top of the agenda because of uh, COVID and um, we're, we're part of a, a big uh, coordinated project called COVID End, um, which has uh, been developing, uh, you know, rapid reviews to, to uh, along with Cochrane, of course, as well, uh, is in this um, to um, provide evidence to inform decisions on, on the COVID uh, pandemic. So, um, uh, and and uh, we had a, a meeting uh, of Evidence Synthesis International just yesterday where we, we have um, uh, talked about moving forward with, uh, with rapid review guidance. Uh, Cochrane has already published some guidance uh, on, on this, but um, we're thinking about how we, how we can move forward on it and uh, what will be appropriate for us to do together as opposed to doing things individually and all having a different definition of rapid reviews, for example, which will probably happen um, if we're, you know, and that would cause problems for the whole evidence synthesis community. So um, yeah, there are, there, that's just one example of the way um, we're already working uh, working together. And um, and I think that's going to be a, a, a really good thing if we can, if we can do that. Maybe I can hand over to Jordi. Yeah, I, I will. Uh go uh, totally support the words of Andrew. So I think that there is, there is spaces where we are already collaborating. I will add also the Global Evidence Summit as a as an space that unfortunately is not going to happen in a physical uh, way this year, but we hope that uh, it could happen again because I think it's a stimulating space where you can get people from, from different perspectives. Uh, I, I think it's important that I, I, I will, yes, for the sake of being devil's advocate, I'd say, I don't think it's necessary that we all have the same definition of rapid review, but definitely that we don't have an unnecessary difference of how we are defining rapid reviews. So it may, it may be that we can have different uh, definitions that fits better the purpose of what you we want to be achieving, but we are recognizing that there are other definitions and, and, and how ours fit with what others are doing so that we don't have differences that are totally artificial or uh, unnecessary when actually we can be uh, doing things together. So I think there is a, 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 otherwise we will be all be in the same organization and doing the same things. And I think it's, there is a beauty of that we are all specializing on different things. On the side with uh, Campbell, for instance, Campbell is using Archie that is our uh, content management system, editorial management system and a lot of other uh, things. Uh, so there, there are spaces where uh, we are already collaborating more actively with other organizations. There is always a space to, to do better and to do well. But I, I think the important thing here is that it serves a purpose. So uh, I would say in Cochrane, we have the, the, the lack or the disgrace of being really big. So as we were doing, doing before, you know, it would be really cool to be able to uh, integrate with a lot of other tools, but that gives us also problems on the downside 
when we are trying to publish data and be sure that all the st statistical data is, is available for others to use, it, it, the, right now, with the level of standardization we have, unfortunately, the only way to do that is to use our closed system tools. Uh, it will be great that we can get into a point that we can use any tool because we, it's everything so well organized that doesn't matter where things have been created, the outputs always look the same. And that will be phenomenal, but they still, uh, we are not there. Right, thank you. And then Vivian. Um, yeah, well, I totally agree um, with what uh, Andrew and Jordi are saying. I think um, the, the, uh, the collaboration that's happening is, is happening because there's a purpose. So as Andrew mentioned, the rapid reviews, you know, there's pressure on all of our organizations to uh, have more timely evidence synthesis and define what that is. So rapid reviews, um, they're you know, various structures out there, but can mean from five to eight different things. So I think as organizations, we want to define um, where we're going. And uh, as Jordi says, we don't have to all agree, um, but it would be good that we, we um, collaborate on how we're defining those things. So I think in the area of methods, you know, that's an example of a method, but there are other areas and methods where we're collaborating across organizations um, uh, Campbell and Cochrane actually have joint methods groups in equity and economics, um, but there are other examples like qualitative evidence synthesis where we have uh, a working group in Campbell that has members from Cochrane, CE, and Campbell. So um, I think there's opportunities for joint learning. I think um, Jordy mentioned the Global Evidence Summit, um, which is this idea of you know joined up meetings where we can share. But the other thing that um, we have quite explicitly in our memorandum of understanding between Campbell and Cochrane uh, is advocacy role. So how do we advocate for evidence um, uh, with um, people who, who make decisions? And uh, one example of that is um, we collaborated on the first uh, World Evidence-Based Healthcare Day um, to organize um, uh, uh, joined up effort uh, in promoting that day. Um, what was I going to say? The other thing we do between Campbell and Cochrane, at least, our scopes have a lot of overlap um, between health and social um, uh, dimensions. And uh, so I, we, in our joint memorandum of understanding, um, there's an agreement there to um, collaborate on making the evidence discoverable and putting it in the best place the best home for the evidence. So I think um, CEE and Campbell will probably have those discussions with Climate Solutions and CEE. Um, but I think we're um, the, the, you know, advantage of collaboration is we avoid duplicating effort and, uh, and we can support each other to make the difference in the world that we want to see. If I could just quickly come in on that, Neil, if, if, if I may, just quick, one of the big discussions with uh, Evidence Synthesis International yesterday uh, was interdisciplinarity and the fact that the world's, you know, all the big social problems, all the, all the big problems are interdisciplinary in their nature and they have aspects of health, social justice, education, economics, and, and of course the environment. Um, and, uh, and so the, to, to address those big problems, we, we need all collaborations and we need uh, systematic reviews in all of these areas um, to, to address some of these wicked problems that we, that we face. And so um, it just makes so much sense to, to move on this together rather than uh, trying to solve things on our own. That's a really great point, thank you. Um, Jackie, I just wanted to come to you now with a, a question that I have. Um, so um, the R community, um, R as a tool, is a, a specific piece of software that was designed for quantitative analysis. Um, and so its background is, is very much traditionally in um, quantitative analysis, primary or secondary. Um, a lot of the people who use R um, for evidence synthesis might be using it in ways that Maybe the terminology is a little bit different from what we understand in systematic review um, communities. And perhaps they, for example, might refer to meta-analyses and not 
um, not be aware so much of these um, sort of gold standards and, and best practices in the searching and other stages of the review process. And I wondered if you might, um, if I could pick on you to speak a little bit about um, people who might not be able to do full systematic reviews, but might be able to make use of resources and advice and support from the collaborations to make their reviews a bit more systematic and why that might be important. Yeah, I guess, um, please stop me or bring me back if I'm going off track here, Neil. Um, I guess the, yeah, I guess what we're trying to get at here is, are there any tips and tricks that people can take from systematic reviewing to bring into their non-systematic review? And this is a really common question, actually. Um, I get asked it a lot um, because a lot of people see a systematic review as a massive undertaking, particularly people who come from a health perspective who actually know what a systematic review is and how long it actually takes in many cases. Um, so yeah, a very common question. I, um, I think there's, there's a really important point here about transparency. Um, first of all, I think those people who have this idea in mind that they want to do a systematic style um, review or meta-analysis is just to recognise what a systematic review is and that what they're doing won't be a systematic review. Um, so that whenever they're describing what they're doing in their protocol or in a final report, it's very clear that they realise what they're doing is not a systematic review and that it shouldn't be cat categorised as one, um, because that's one of the main downfalls that we come up with, uh, that we see. Um, there are certainly uh, a lot of points in which um, systematic review methodology can be can inform non-systematic reviews. Um, so you could probably go through all of the stages of a, of a review and pick out various points in which you could um, you could translate that methodology. So for example, in terms of the first stage, which is question setting and, and planning, um, it may be important for the, these, these non-systematic reviewers, I'm gonna call them, to really think very carefully about their question. They might, might not go through the same process that a systematic review would go through where they might have stakeholder engagement, they might have iterative processes, um, they might undertake a, a long process of scoping, but they can sort of slim that process down um, and, uh, and sort of work perhaps on their own or with one other person about question formulation. Um, and perhaps one of the things that would really save time here, but also bring in some of that systematic review methodology is to uh, have a conversation with someone who does systematic reviews. So in what areas of that, their non-systematic review, can they bring in parts? What, where, where are the efficiencies going to lie? And that will depend very much on the question that's being asked. Um, and it will depend very much on the time and resources that that person has. Um, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, and I, I probably don't want to go through all of those stages and sort of pick out which stage, you know, where you could do that and describe that. Um, but I would say get a systematic review expert on board, just have a conversation with them. Um, and they're probably best place to advise you on what to do and where you can take learnings. Brilliant, thank you so much. I was just monitoring anything else that was coming in there. Um, really interesting points. Um, I wonder if I could hand uh, back over to Vivian, Jordi and Andrew um, to uh, perhaps have some comments. Um, still got time left um, about how formally the collaborations might be able to support people who might not be able to do full systematic reviews in their opinion. Um, and perhaps if they're coming from a perspective of doing meta-analysis, what, what the responsibilities of these organizations are um, from a sort of, my um, analogy that I give quite often, the carrot and the stick. So the policing the quality of reviews on one end, and then sort of promoting and incentivizing uh, better practices in the other, just on top of what Jackie's said, which was great. Um, Vivian. Okay, I can see Jordi didn't want you to pick him first. <laughs> He's making a face. Um, okay, well, I mean, we, interesting, Campbell, we moved to, uh, have an explicit policy about accepting uh, reviews um, with what we call retrospective registration so that we don't require the protocol be registered with Campbell, uh, provided the review meets our methodic expectations. So, I mean, I think our role is to encourage 
Um, Jackie, as you said, transparency and systematic rigorous systematic reviews. Um, so when we do get uh, requests for registrations like that, um, uh, I think our role is to support doing better. Um, I hope that's what's in, I hope that's what you intended, Neil. I mean, we, we do have, you know, I think actually, Jackie, you mentioned in the first part that one of our roles as evidence coordinating bodies is training and capacity building. And um, obviously, uh, Campbell um, had a, actually a long history of one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring uh, and capacity building. And um, I, I think that is a role that many in Campbell still play. Um, and we are developing uh, training material to support to, to support that. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Let's see what Andrew and Jordy have to say. <laughs> Andrew, you're in the middle, so you're going next. <laughs> just, unmute, just unmute myself there. Um, so, so CE has, has taken a kind of a pragmatic approach, I think, to this because uh, we've um, uh, undertaken several studies that have looked at the state of evidence reviews generally in, in the environmental sector. Um, and um, we've developed a, a tool which we call CSAT, um, which is a, a critical appraisal tool essentially for um, for evidence reviews uh, that match tries to match what the authors have done with um, what the CE standards are at several levels. And uh, when we first uh, took a sample in 2015 of, of everything that was being published uh, globally, um, then we we found that the uh, the assessments were really low. I mean, they they were terrible. Uh, is, is there's no other word for it really um is, as far as we're concerned because we're concerned about standards that doesn't mean to say that the reviews were were wrong in any sense or that they were untrue or anything it was just that the risk of bias uh in those in those reviews um is, is high so we said we've set about putting some things in place which will help authors um well not only authors actually but editors and peer reviewers as well um in in journals in environmental journals to improve the standards of reviews and um and so what we what we've been doing over the last three years and, and jackie mentioned it uh, earlier on was develop this um, database of evidence reviews called cedar which uh, essentially is uh, are all the evidence reviews we can find um, using a systematic search of course um published in the environmental sector every year and um, we, we appraise all of those, we critically appraise all of them and put them on the, on the database if they make a claim to have measured an effect or measured an impact uh, of something uh, and they're environmentally relevant. So um, that's, that's a service to evidence consumers, but at the same time, it, um, it, it demonstrates standards um, for authors, editors and peer reviewers, and it shows them um, where, how easily, in some cases, very easily, through better reporting and better planning, they can improve sort of incrementally the, the quality and, and reliability, um, transparency, all of those things of, of their reviews. Um, and so, so we've got tips and we're developing tips and tricks, just as Jackie says, um, to really start off with some of the easiest things that that authors can do to make to make their reviews better, um, because we do we feel that if we set very very high standards in the environmental field, then um, we're going to be largely ignored um, and uh, ignored by editors. We're certainly ignored by editors of other journals. I I know that because um, they publish things called systematic reviews that, as Neil knows, that. Uh, are nowhere near the, the, the standards of, of systematic reviews. So we've got a real problem in that sense. But we've got to work with authors and editors and peer reviewers to, to change things. And we've got to make it easy for them. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. That's a really good point. Thank you. OK, I, I think I'm going to go a bit on the contrary here, or at least provide the cautionary tale of what we what had happened in health and, and see how this could talk about your future or not, uh, because as Andrew was talking, no, saying uh, 
Cochrane was there 25 years ago when we joined the organization to say, well, we had a handful of, of really well done reviews, at least that's what we thought at that point when we were doing them. Uh, and we were trying, and, and, and we partnered with the University of York to produce a database of reviews of effectiveness that they were looking at all the reviews published elsewhere and tried to make a critical appraisal of what we have there. But 25 years later, right now, the problem we have is a, is a total intoxication of uh, evidence synthesis. There are far too many systematic reviews about almost any topic. There are some topics that there are twice the number of systematic reviews that there are of primary studies. And you say, this is insane. So, uh, and, and in part, it's our fault. We have made so easy to get training about evidence synthesis. We have made uh, so easy to get the tools to produce a meta-analysis and so on, that a, a, anyone who with a minimal training could just go on and say that th this is a systematic review following the Cochrane methods and this is out. Whether they follow the Cochrane methods or not, despite saying that, that's a different, uh, co completely different question. And we have a similar po policy than, than Vivian, not to say, yes, we accept protocols that are published according to our Mercedes standards in other journals. However, I think is, uh, I, I don't know if there is any, any review that have ever reached uh, this point. And if there are, there is a handful that you can say is the exception that confirms the rule. Uh, and basically, and, and why I'm saying that and say, well, publishing good protocols is hard. And we have almost 30 years of experience in Cochrane on how to do protocols. And still now, I'm not uh, convinced that we, we got it totally right. We still, if you look at the sections of difference with the protocol that we have in the reviews, we still need, need to change a lot of things of what we are doing. So... Uh, the editor-in-chief of Cochrane, Carlos Suarez uh, Weiser, did a, a, a check-in, no? say, what is the average of hours of peer review that get a, a, a quality assurance, she, she, she called it, in a Cochrane review? And we calculate that the average is 70 hours. Now, you check how many hours you can expect a normal journal will take to do the peer review. I will say probably two is a reasonable estimate. Ten, if you want to be generous. But this is far not enough to be able to check all the things that we are doing in Cochrane. Are we right in Cochrane? Well, I, I, we are right on the thing that we do 70 hours because we actually keep finding things. And then we continue looking until uh, we don't find more things to find. Is that reasonable? I don't know. There is no RCT showing that this is the right way of doing it. And this is a, a, a thing that we should punish ourselves for not generating data of what is the optimal way of doing the peer review for, a, for a evidence synthesis. But uh, going to the point, should we promote doing evidence synthesis even if they are poor quality? I would say, well, there is a point of advocacy for the idea that an evidence synthesis is better than the starting from scratch, like nothing was all done before. Totally agree. But definitely we need to put the emphasis on the quality too. And if that means that sometimes uh, some people get pissed off, then let's piss them off. <laughs> and then let's have a conversation about saying, well, if you are accepting that you can publish something with an error that could uh, sidetrack this particular field with the wrong message for that particular piece of time, then so be it. But I, I don't think it's my role to do that. My role is to be sure that my readers are getting the, the best answer with the techniques of what we know now we can provide. And, and we know in 10 years, maybe what we were doing now is wrong, and then in 10 years, we're going to change what we are doing. But at this point, that's the best that we think we can do. And, and that's what people should uh, receive. The problem we have is also that the, the, the academic recognition and system of rewards is totally corrupted on this sense. Because it, it promotes that you have a lot of marks in your, in your belt of, say, I published so many articles. And there is no control of whether these articles contributed to anything, whether they were replicated, they were repeating something that was already done and we knew the answer already for that. Uh, and there is no incentive to say it, it, it's what you are doing is unique and it's helping others to, to make better decisions. That is at the end what we are aiming to. So I would say this is bigger than our organizations. So we are not going to change the university reward system and how their CVs are evaluated in this talk today. But I think that we should... Uh, try to raise to a bigger standard and try to have this discussion 
of saying is having a, a an span of bad research a good thing for the for the field? And I will say probably the answer is no, or at least no if it doesn't come with a conversation about how we make it better. That's a great point and a great point to um, to end on there. We have 10 minutes before the final closing session. Um, I'd just like to extend my thanks again to the four of you. It's really interesting discussion. Um, I'd encourage uh, everybody if they want to read more about the Campbell collaboration, uh, Cochrane and the collaboration for environmental evidence to check out their websites and their uh, resources for training and um, guidance for systematic reviews. Um, thank you again. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. And, Thanks, uh, Amy. Look